Peace. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's take our Bibles to a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, Luke chapter number 15. Uh, I want to zero in on verse number 20. And of course, Luke 15 deals with the uh, parable that Jesus gives for the sake of the Pharisees that have criticized him for spending time and eating with sinners. And his emphasis to them in this uh, parable, in the trilogy of this parable, three parts, is that they're not only sinners, they're lost. And of course, that puts value on something when it is, to you, it is lost. In other words, I've never really lost a penny because it's not that valuable to me. I've walked down the street and seen pennies lay there and never stopped to pick them up and uh, so on. But I have uh, misplaced $20 bills and went through all my pants pocket to try to find it, haven't you? And if I was walking down the sidewalk and I was to happen to have a $100 bill and it blow out, I'd run in front of a truck and get it. I'll just tell you that right now because it would be lost. And Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, uh, these folks, they are lost. And of course, he talks about the uh, shepherd with the hundred sheep. But he said, now one of them's lost. One of them's lost. I'm going after the one. And then uh, the lady that has the headdress of ten pieces of silver, representing uh, probably her uh, wedding. And uh, she's lost one of them. She only has nine. She's going to sweep until she finds it. And then we come to the parable of the uh, father that has two sons, but one of them is lost. Here's what I want to emphasize to you for a moment, is that I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you've been found if you're saved. But understand, it ain't just about us. There's always one more out there that is lost that he desires to reach. And what I want to preach on tonight is one more by love. One more by love. And what we're going to notice in this parable that you've read many times is the emphasis that If you drew the love of this father, if you took that out of this text, this parable would mean nothing. There are a lot of components that make up the story of the prodigal son. Of course, there is the father, the elder brother. There is home. There's the far country. There's the citizens of those uh, far country. There's those uh, fickle friends. There's the, the, the swine pen, hog pen all of those things. There's the return back home as he heads back, uh, the, the son himself, back to the father. But if he had not been greeted and met with the father's love, the story would have been in vain. But isn't that true in that it's the heart of the gospel? I'm glad that Jesus came, was born incarnate in flesh. Great is the mystery of God. God manifested in the flesh. I'm glad that he fulfilled all of the law and lived a perfect life. I'm thankful for the miracles that he performed. And, uh, of course, for his going to Calvary, dying on the cross and being buried and rose again the third day. But what I want to say to you, that if if the heart of all of that was not the fact that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, what meaning would it be for you and I? If God just saved us and put up with us and took us to heaven, we'd be miserable. But I'm going to tell you, the heart of every bit of it is the love of God. And of course, everybody that's ever found and saved experiences this very love of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. God. I'm interested in that. I want to emphasize verse 20. You know the story of the prodigal. He comes to his dad and he said, you know, give me what belongs to me. He heads off into that far country, lives that riotous life. The famine comes. He gets in want. He goes out, begins to beg. And uh, he's sent into the fields to feed swine. And then the light comes on. He comes to his senses and he said, what in the world am I doing here? And he begins to remember and ponder what was at the house. And of course makes his journey back. 
And uh, he's got a speech in mind in verse 19. But look in verse 20. I want to zero in on that. And he arose and came to his father. But yet when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You can be seated. What Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is what we must be careful with in our religion is that the very most important ingredient that you do not have is love. They had no love for these sinners. But aren't you glad when the Lord saved you, the Bible said he shed abroad that very divine love within our hearts that gave us the ability to love Him, but not only to love Him, but to love others as He loves through us. And may I say to you, there's a whole world out there that needs to experience the love of God. But I'm thinking about the one more that God may send our way. That if they're ever going to see the love of God, they're not going to see it in the trees and in the sky and in the grass. They're going to see it in the lives of the people of those that God has loved and then He loves through them. I want to emphasize three simple truths about this one more by love. One more. And you could spell that one either of two ways. O N E. Or W-O-N, because this old boy was won by love. The first thing that I want to emphasize to you is I look into this parable. I realize that love is seen in all things. In everything from verse number 11 all the way down to the end of the chapter that entails the prodigal son parable, is filled with the love of God. Love is seen in all of this parable. Now, I'd ask you this before I expound on it. I wonder, do you have to look far beyond where you're at to find out that he loves you? Don't you see his love for you represented in just about everything that you see and feel and know that he has done for you? It is so with him. I think that we could see this matter of love uh, as we look at this parable. We see the spirit of love. It is very evident in verse 20 as the father goes out to this wayward son who has finally come home, not to chastise him, but to embrace him. And as the twain comes together, there issues from that a radiation of nothing but love. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I didn't know anything about the love of God until I got saved. And the first thing that he gave me was his love. I had been in that little storefront church on three occasions before I got saved. And I'll tell you, I didn't feel anything. They preached to me and I heard the truth and I looked in their eyes and I figured they had something that I didn't have or maybe I wanted or didn't want, whatever it was. But I walked out of there and that's all there was to it. But I'll tell you, on that Sunday morning when I went back after I got saved, I went back amongst the people of love being a person of love because the very divine love had loved on me and that love had loved on them. And when we got together, that love loved on each other. And I tell you, I've been a loving ever since. Not with a human love, but with a heavenly love on a different and higher plane. And don't you love it when God's people get together and the whole atmosphere of that service is radiated and permeated with one thing. And the one thing that you want to say to one another before you leave is, I love you! 
The very spirit of life dominated this scene and the very spirit of life dominates the very work of God in your heart and in my heart. Aren't you glad that He loved you? But thank God He loves through you and we can love. (laughs) You don't have to fake it anymore. It's real. There is here this very spirit of love just by the embracing that takes place. But not only that, I would notice the symbols of love. Notice uh, the father sort of interrupts the son because of love. It is the son that comes back and says, Look, Dad, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Why don't you so hold it just... Hold it just a moment. And he turns in verse number 22, and he says, go get the best robe. (laughs) I love this. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet. Think about that. Now, understand, this is uh, is not the kind of clothes, and I've got nothing against Walmart that this... This dad has got for this boy. But it's the best. He said, go get... There's not going to be another one compared to this. Get the best robe. Yes, Yes, he's dressed in tattered garments and torn garments and wallowed garments in the filth of the far land. But I want you to put the best robe on him. I want you to get those shoes I've had prepared Put them on him. And I want you to get that ring. And I want you to put that ring on him. Can you imagine in weeks and months uh, and days ahead in the different gatherings that he goes into and people see him coming dressed as he is? Wow, look at that guy over there. (laughs) Look at that. Man, how in the world did you get all of that? And of course, there are those that are inquisitive, and I can hear them say to the boy, they can say to him, My lens, where did you get those shoes? What's the brand on that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he said, You can't get them in this world. That just, it was a special brand right there. Yeah. My father got them put together for me. Your father gave you those shoes? He said, Or did. Well, what about that coat you got on? That suit's got to be a two or three thousand dollar suit. Where did where'd you get that? He said, Oh, well, I just have to tell you, my father got that for me. Oh, what about that ring? I mean, what about that gold that's on that ring and that carrot that's in that ring and that gem and that ring? Where did you get a ring like that? He said, my father gave it to you. They said, my, you must have been a very responsible son. You must have been a very dutiful son. You must have been a very cautious and obedient son. He said, oh, no, you got it all wrong. These shoes don't say anything about me. These, this coat doesn't say anything about me. This ring doesn't say anything about me. It says everything about my father. Oh, what I am tonight, what I have tonight, what God has blessed me with tonight, I'm going to tell you physically and spiritually, has nothing to do with me and where I came from. It has everything to do with the father's love. It's got nothing to do with me. It has everything. Uh, Love is seen in all things. Everything you see there says, my daddy loves me, my daddy loves me. I'll say to you, everything you see right here symbolizes my father loves me. But it's not only in that that I see Love in all things. Love is seen in all things, not only through the spirit of love, the symbol of love, but through the sacrifice of love. He comes home to a sacrifice. As he says to him, I want you to kill, I want you to kill the fatted calf. Now, you know, I, I used to feel as though that this fatted calf, all there was to it was is they wanted to eat and have a good time. 
But I began, began, began to ponder and realize that this is not in the New Testament economy. When he gives this parable, it's still in the days of which sacrifices were offered. This is still under the Old Testament. Yeah. They still offered sacrifices in that temple all the time. And then I went all the way back to Job and... In chapter number 1, I realized, you know, when Job's children, they got together and had a feast. While they were feasting, the Bible said that Job went and prayed and gave offerings on their behalf lest he, because he did not know what might have gotten into their hearts. He was getting between them and God through the sacrifice. May I say to you, while this father loved this son and while this father embraced this son and while we see this love all the way through here, I want you to know it was a free love, but it was not a love that did not cost because he sacrificed this lamb without blemish for the sake of the son. He was paying for that boy's sin when he killed that lamb. <laughs> I want you to know the love of God's not cheap. He sacrificed his son and he paid for my sin. He said, I'm going to make this thing right. So everywhere you look, what you see is nothing but love. Love is seen in all things. Can't you see God's love? Yeah. All around you. Even can't you see God's love in that wife and that his love in that husband and his love in those children and those grandchildren and his love in that job and his love the, just, just the, 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 his love and the peace that you have and the joy that you have and the provisions that you his love abounds, the Bible said. It abounds. I was preaching in a uh, camp meeting years ago, and in the back I heard a lady testify, and come to find out she was in her 80s. She was exuberant in praising God because of His provisions on her account. Yeah. And I'll never forget, with tears, she, she, uh, she expressed it this way. She said, God has blessed me with both hands. Well, I never heard that before. But I got to thinking about it. He's blessed me so much, I don't see how he in one hand. He's had to bless me with both hands. <laughs> Hadn't he blessed you with both hands? He's blessed you with the left and he's blessed you with the right. He's blessed you on the left hand and on the right hand. He keeps on blessing you and he keeps on blessing me. Several years ago, I, I heard him interview a basketball player. I love to watch basketball. And he had won the game in the last second with a left-handed shot. And they were really talking about that because they knew that he was a right-handed shooter. So in the interview, they said, man, well, how in the world did you do that? How did you make that move with the left hand? How in the world were you able to do that? And he said, well, I'm amphibious. <laughs> well, I laughed about that, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad that my God is ambidextrous. Yeah. And what I want you to know, that once this boy sees that his father loves him, what he sees is, is that it always loved him. Yeah. Because when he got home, what he is seeing, I'm going to tell you what he has, what he has seen. Let me word it this way. What he is seeing, what he is seeing when he get, gets home, he has seen before, but he never saw it. Are you understanding? In other words, God can be good to you all around you, but you'll never see it unless you see it through His love. He had seen it before. What He's seeing, He had seen, but He never saw it. 
But oh, he's seeing it now. And it is here that he realizes that the Father has always loved him. This is not the first pair of shoes he's been given, not the first coat he's put on. I'm going to tell you, not the first that the Father's hugged him. His Father, the Father, had loved him before. You see, I, while I didn't realize it, the truth of the matter is, God was loving me before I even knew that he loved me. Oh. Uh, Illustrate that and go to my second thought. I was preaching my brother's funeral in West Virginia. And uh, while I was there during the visitation hours, I ran into a boy that I was raised with many years before. And he was standing there, he and I were talking, and there was an elderly lady came up who came to the visitation and she shook hands with me. I knew well who she was. I spoke to her and after she left, the fellow that was standing beside me, he said, you know that was the nastiest family out on the hill. Tears welled up in my eyes and I said, yeah, I know that. (laughs) But what you don't know is the many times that I went into that little old house to get something to eat. And she would allow me to eat what Even her children were eaten because she knew it in my house many times. Because of no mother and a drunken father all of those years. Can't tell you how many times I'd come home and and I'd see that that Crisco lard can, you know, got that cherry pie on it. It just, my, my tongue would beat my brains out. I'd be so hungry. But I could go across that hill, I'm telling you. I could go across that hill. I can't tell you how many homes would welcome me in and let me eat. And I didn't realize until after I got saved that God was loving me before I knew he loved me. I can see his love all the way back. And if he loved me before and he loves me now, I got no doubt his love will last throughout all of his time. Love is seen. In all things. The second thing that I want to emphasize to you from verse number 20 that's found in it is that love sees all things. I'm talking about from the Father's perspective now. Look in verse number 20. He arose and came to his Father. But when he was yet a great way off, his Father did what? Saw him. Saw him. (laughs) <laughs> there wouldn't have been nobody else on the farm that would have recognized this boy. Not a chance. There's too much, there's too much change as he's heading up the trail. But I like what D.L. Moody said. He said only the father could recognize this boy, but the way he recognized him was through the telescope of his love. He'd been looking for him. He looked out there and he said, there's my boy. He's a coming. And everybody's standing around saying, no, that ain't him. That can't be your boy. And you wouldn't have thought that it was the boy unless you was the father who had a heart filled with love because you see the love of the father could see the distance and pick up on him. The love of the father could see beyond all of the filth and all of the dirt that was upon him. The love of the Father could even see the distance or, or the difference or the change that was there. Right. And nothing about this boy, nothing about this boy like what he was when he left. Yeah. When he left, he was very proud, he was very arrogant, thought he deserved everything. He came back so diminished and so broken and so humbled. He thought he deserved nothing. Nobody else would have recognized that. But the father could tell that was the son in his approach. He's coming bowed down. He's coming lowered. He's coming humbled. And the father said, that's the boy. I recognize him in his approach. I recognize him in spite of his appearance. The clothes that are on his back. 
uh, are tattered and torn and soiled and everything else and he comes home no doubt beaten and battered and slime all over him. But the father has no problem seeing him. Amen. Now the father is not fooled by him. No. Truth of the matter is he, he, he sees who this boy was. He knows who he was. He sees who this boy is. He knows that that's him coming down the road. But most of all, love sees who this boy is going to be. He knows what he's able to do as far as this boy is concerned. He sees it all. And his love has been able to uh, reach beyond, to view beyond, and to see beyond every bit of that. Aren't you glad that God's love saw you for who you were? God's love sees you for who you are. But God's love sees you for what He can do for you when His love changes your life. Love! Love sees all things. And I'm glad it is His love that's looking at me. And aren't you glad that it is His love and not His law that is looking at you? And He's saying to all of these Pharisees, you're looking through the wrong eyes. You need to be looking through the eyes of love. And if the one more in this old world is going to be brought back home, it's going to be brought back home through a heart that loves with a father's love. Love is seen in all things. Love sees all things. But I want to go back to that verse one more time. One more by love. And I want you to notice how that love says all things. Love says all things. I'm interested in the wording of it. Look in verse 20 again. He arose and came to his father. But yet when he's a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, you would think that under the circumstances that have transpired, that there'd have to be a lot of issues settled right here before the two could be brought back together. You would think that maybe the father, first of all, would go out there and he would ask some questions based upon the knowledge that he's got that, by the way, he got from the elder brother. You know, it's the elder brother. I'm amazed the elder brother knew about, more about the far country than anybody did. I'm sort of thinking that's how the younger boy got it in his heart. And he's come, and I, I mean, he could have went out to that old boy, and he said, all right, we've got to talk some things over now. I'm, I'm glad you're back. And I, I can see him standing off because he's coming out of that world. Yeah. All of the filth, all of the iniquity, all of the righteousness, all of the sin. I mean, he represents right now everything that's ever... I mean, if you can imagine it, you could almost think he got involved in it. And he's bringing every bit of that. I mean, it's all over him. The smell of the hog pen and the slime is all over him. He's covered with it. Who knows how in the world could you live in a world like that without coming back with some kind of an ailment, some kind of sickness, and some kind of a disease. And can you see the father coming and saying, now hold it, I, I would, I, I, I want, I, uh, son, I, man, where, <sighs> you spent all the money, I guess, didn't you? Yeah. And I would, I would, I, you know, get him a, I, what I want you to do is go in there and take a bath and everything before I even get close to you. I'm afraid to even shake hands with you the way you are. Yeah. <laughs> 
And there's some things we're going to have to talk about now, and I mean, it's going to be tough. I, I mean, we're going to have to settle some issues about, we're going to have to come clear and clean with everything. That, and I've got, I got some papers you're going to have to sign, some documents. I, I tell you to prove that, you know, that you're done with that place and that system, that world. We, we're going to have to settle everything. And everybody else has got the same questions. And I can hear him saying, boy, that boy ever comes back, he's going to get it. <laughs> I mean, he ain't never had it more like a daddy's going to give it to him. If he ever comes back, he's in trouble. And here he comes with everything that you could ever bring that's been touched by the world. And he comes back home. And the father sees him. And he does two things. He has compassion on him. He runs and falls on his neck. And my whole thought centers around this. I've waited till now to say till he kisses. I looked that word up, kisses. I didn't realize it. It's a compound word. It has a prefix is the word kata, K-A-T-A. It, uh, it simply means it's called in the imperfect tense. In other words, you never want to stop doing it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, um, so he didn't just run out there and stand off and say, and now boy, I'll tell you what, now I'm, 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 we're going to talk this over. I'm afraid of getting too close to you. <laughs> no! The first part of that word is a, is a constant continual action that your heart never wants to stop. The second part of that word is the word phileo. Yeah, it is the word love. Yeah. And uh, in the scripture, you'll find often that that word is in reference to God's love also. The Bible said in John 16, 27, For the Father himself loveth you. That's the very same word. You look it up. It's the word phileo. Yeah. Interchangeably, it's the same word. So when I look at that, what I'm saying, seeing is, is the Father's heart is so filled with divine love Amen. that love covereth a multitude of what? Sin. And he ran out to that boy. He wasn't smelling nothing. He wasn't seeing nothing. He grabbed that old boy and he hugged him and he started kissing. And the slimes on his lips and the filth and the smell. But he ain't smelling anything. He keeps on kissing and kissing. You got grand youngins, ain't you? If you have, you know what I'm talking about. I got 13 grand youngins. Every time I get around, I want to go. I want to keep on kissing. He grabs this old boy and he kisses and he kisses and he kisses and he kisses. I'm going to ask you something. What else is there to be said? <laughs> it's all been said. Huh? You see, those two words, he kisses him and he has compassion on him. The word kisses, it indicates that it, it, what he wants the boy to feel. In other words, as he's kissing that boy, he's letting that boy feel what he feels. Right. <laughs> oh, you understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. That's your heart. It's what you're doing. And when he grabs that boy and embraces him, it's chest to chest, heart to heart. He's feeling his daddy's heartbeat. Boop, to the boop, to the boop, to the boop. And he's kissing all over him. He's, he's, he's feeling... His father's love. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Good. Aren't you glad the Lord didn't just tell you he loved you? Oh, but he got so close and that he came in you and he gave you his divine love. Hallelujah. I've said this and said it often. 
I say it humbly, there is no more God sitting on the throne of heaven but what abides in this little heart. I got every bit of him. And I'm going to tell you the main ingredient is the divine love of God that has filled my heart. He's letting me feel his heart beat. (laughs) Daddy loves me, this I know, he's saying. (laughs) Well, what do you say about that? He's kissing him. But he has compassion on him. Now you can look up the word compassion. It's the same in the Greek as it is in your English dictionary. It means to feel someone else's feelings. Huh? You know what he's doing? He's getting so close to this boy. He's embracing this boy. And he's taking what's in him, everything that's in him, he's putting in that boy. He said, boy, we ain't never going to talk about this. This is all settled, the kissing and embracing. What that says is all that needs to be said because what it says is you're still my son and I still love you and you'll never be any less the son than what you've always been and you'll always be accepted and this is over. I'll take my heart. He took his heart and put it in the son. So that the son would never doubt that the father loved him. He never had to question it. That's in the kissing. But in the compassion. What compassion is, is me wanting to feel what you feel. So when he's a hugging, are y'all seeing this? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm ready to eat, so I don't want to preach much longer. But I can't mean, what he's doing when he's, a, when he's a kissing him, he's a putting his heart in him. Right. But when he's having compassion, he's taking everything in this boy out of him. <laughs> he's feeling it. compassion means to be touched. Jesus said, the Bible said, for we have not a great high priest which cannot be one touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I'm telling you what happened. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Ghost, when you got saved, loved you and put God's heart in you and then reached in you and got everything that was in that heart. All the condemnation, all the sin, all the world, all the slime, all of the guilt, and took it in himself. He said, I'm going to put your heart, my heart in you, then I'm going to take your heart out of you. I'm going to consume every bit of that. Have you ever realized why when you got saved you just felt like a new creature. Yeah. Yeah. All the, the Bible said there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That boy come up there like this. Oh daddy I don't even know how to say this. I'm worried about talking to him. I'm afraid to, he's going to be so upset at me. <laughs> Nothing needs to be said. Huh? Why? Because love says it. Love is seen in all things. Love sees all things, but love says all things. Amen, brother. Now, them Pharisees, they're standing over there, and you know what they got? They got their little ruler. Oh, here he comes. Now, the elder brother, he's got that in him. Oh, here he comes. Hey, you know, did you realize that in the Old Testament, it seemed like everything was measured? Yeah. You read it. The Bible, the Old Testament's full of measurements, whether you're talking about the temple or the tabernacle or, or Ezekiel walking out into the world. Everything's measured. Did you know when you get to the New Testament, ain't nothing measured? Because in the Old Testament, you're operating under the law. In the New Testament, you're operating under love, the very heart of God. He ain't measuring nothing. You can't measure Jesus no how. How are you going to measure the love of God? You can't even define it. Don't pull out your measuring stick. Yeah, it won't work. That's all right. Amen. 
Now come here and let me see. You, now listen. And that's what's the problem with a lot of marriages. Well, I'll tell you, I, I did this much today, and you only done that much. Mm-hmm. Well, that church over there, they do like this, but they don't do like this. Well, I'll tell you what, I, t- I, I just, and we go around, don't we measure so much? Yeah. Love doesn't measure. Love settles it. Oh. Now, wouldn't you hate to have been that boy if when he got home, the daddy said, now just go in there and clean up and we'll talk about it later. Lived under those, that spirit so that he's tiptoeing around the house all the time. Somebody said, how come you sneak around all the time? It's daddy. Every, every time I get around him, he wants to talk about the money I lost. He wants to know again how much and where. And he talks about the, the, the he wants to know if I had any. I just, it bothers me. <laughs> that ain't happening at the father's Amen. house. <laughs> no. Matter of fact, the father ain't never going to talk about it again. And he ain't going to let nobody else talk about it. The elder brother tried it and he got shut up. (laughs) Huh? If you ever go around talking like the devil accusing the children of God, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get rebuked by the Spirit of God. The Father ain't going to put up with you talking about it. The other fact, there's only one person in this parable that's allowed to talk about this boy's past. You know who it is? Him! (laughs) You won't forget what he forgave. You won't forget what he did for you. You won't forget how he changed you. But honey, nobody else can talk about it. (laughs) He's been brought home by love. Now, don't tell the Baptists. But the Bible said as a result of that, there was music and dancing. I don't know. Is that what it said? Somebody said, did you look it up in the Greek? I did. And you know what it means? Music and dancing. But understand, the boy didn't set that up. The father did. And I'll tell you something, if you get home, you've been forgiven, you've been set free, and you're full for the first time and who knows when, and you got the favor of the Father, well, it's time to party. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Can you imagine that old boy? He's got home, and I'm going to tell you the thing that's got him now is the Father's love. Father's love. He sits down for the first meal that he's had. You know, he never had been hungry before when he got in the far country, and he's been hungry for who knows how long, and now he sits down to the first meal. I can see him looking at that meal, and he's, <laughs> he starts crying. <laughs> Raises his hand now, and he says, Woo! <laughs> Looks at his dad, he's, Woo! And that old brother sitting over saying, Daddy, would you quiet him down? I can't eat. He's disturbing my meal. The daddy looks at the elder brother and says, Son, I can't stop him. He was dead and he's alive again. <laughs> you haven't been dead and you're alive again, honey. You want to rejoice. Goes into the bedroom, he ain't sat in a good bed and who knows when. He's just been forgiven, washed up, clean. He's got the best clothes on and shoes he's ever had. He lays over in that bed and he says, Woo! The elder brother's in the next room over there. He said, Daddy, I ain't able to sleep with him acting like that, quieting him down. He said, Boy, I can't. He was dead and he's alive again. He's been gone and he's home. Let him alone. <laughs> That's it. That's all of us. Hallelujah. We come home and we found one thing. The Father loved us. <laughs> the love.
love of God greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. Reaches far beyond the high star to the lowest hell. That old boy, he's feeling the Father's love. Do you know, I remember back, and I close with this, I was six years old. I had to be put in the hospital. Stayed five weeks. And again, I mentioned how I was raised. No mother in the home, just kids and everything. And I got down to where off, point of death. And some, someone come and got me and took me. It wasn't my dad to the hospital. Stayed five weeks, and when I got out, my uncle and aunt, Roy and Alice, my dad's brother and his wife, they came, and they the ones that took me home because they knew I could, wouldn't be taken care of when I got home or could. So I went and stayed with them for a few weeks, and I'll never forget now, this etched in my mind as a six-year-old kid. Aunt Alice came in there, and she said, Now, Dana, I need to talk to you. She said, me and your Uncle Roy's been discussing and said, what we'd like to do is just let you be our boy. Said, we'll raise you, send you to school, feed you, do everything that you need. And you'll just be our boy. But she said, I didn't want to talk to Lester, your daddy, until I first asked you. And she said, I wanted to ask you how you felt about it. Well, here's the thing. The way I was raised was like pagans. I mean, we was raised like pagans. Preach up in, uh, for a fella up in uh, Canton, Ohio, many, many times. He called me one day and he said, Brother Dana, I had a lady come to church this morning. She was leaving. I shook hands with her and asked her where she had from. I never knew her. I never had seen her before. And she said, West Virginia. And he said, I don't know why I did this. What's the chance? He said, I looked at her and said, you don't know a Dana Williams and Joe Williams and so on. I said she stopped and she said, yes, sir, I do. And she said, I don't want to be offensive. But I'm going to tell you the truth. She said, I lived down beyond them. And she said, everybody was afraid to drive by that house. You never knew what was going to happen. I tell folks I was raised in a dysfunctional family, but it, 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 it didn't affect me none. <laughs> But at, at that time, uh, there, was, there was 11 of us. Two died as babies, but I was the youngest of the nine that was home. And, but two of them had already got old enough to move out. So there's seven of us there at the house. And with all that was going on in that home, there was one thing that prevailed. And that was that we seven young'uns loved each other yeah. very strongly. Now, we'd beat and bang on each other, and I got more beat up than anybody because I was the youngest. But here, we wouldn't let nobody else do it. Yeah. I knew my brothers and sisters. It's like stair stepped. Every one of us is two years apart all the way up. Uh, but I knew that they loved me with a passion, and I loved them with a passion. I knew that there was a love there. And when my aunt offered that, I had no hesitation. She said, we'll be your parents. We'll take care of you. And I looked at her. And I said, no, I, I don't want that. I want to go home. And you know why I wanted to go home? Because of love. Yeah, yeah. Because of love. And I can't help but believe that the thing that drew this old boy back home is he could, he, he had, he'd seen this before, but he never saw it. Amen. He'd never received it. Yeah. But when he'd come awake, he realized, they, if anybody's going to take me, it's going to be daddy. And he wasn't wrong. Hey. <laughs> Jesus loves me. This I know. You say, how do you know? Because of what he put in me and what he took out of me. Hey. It had to be love. Yeah. One more. I love. And I'll tell you, 
It ain't just about us. But I promise you there's one more out there that God wants to love, and if he does, he's going to love them through you and me. Let's stand.